We're going to start a series called Malachi. And let me just start right off. Some of you are sitting there and go, oh, oh, he's raising money. Because every preacher in town, when they preach about Malachi, is because money is running low and the church needs offering. That is furthest from the truth in this church. Let me tell you this. We're not going to be receiving any donation or raising any money or whatever. And besides that, um, I always say this, don't worry about donation. Um, We're going to talk more about that later on. So Malachi is not about the book on money, okay? So uh, it's actually it's much deeper than that, but we're going to do an extensive study on Malachi. So by the time you finish here, you have more knowledge about this Old Testament uh, scripture than 99% of the people outside, you know, uh, who have not heard about Malachi because everybody thought Malachi is just about tithing and giving. So this is not a giving offering. Turn to your neighbor and say, don't worry. <laughs> Okay, that's good. All right, we're going to get started. Let me give you an intro of what Malachi is and what this book is all about. I know there's a lot of theology and Bible college graduates here, but you know, um, uh, sometimes if I say something disagree with what you have been familiar with or told, you will not be offended, right? Amen? And besides that, we're all going to heaven because we call upon the name of the Lord. The Bible says, he who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And we call upon the name of Jesus and we're saved. Amen. So Malachi was written during the time when Ezra and Nehemiah was around. So Malachi was a contemporary to uh, Ezra and Nehemiah. And what, when was that? That was when the people of Israel had already returned from exile, number one. Then number two, they have finished rebuilding the temple. So by the time Malachi was written, this temple, the second temple, was already being, had already been rebuilt. Okay, so that is the circumstance we're in. Now, Malachi, of course, is the last book of the Old Testament. Many of you know that. And uh, it is a, consider a, 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 a book uh, written by a minor prophet. So if you want to see how the Bible is organized, for those of you who just got saved, you know, you don't know about this. The Bible is organized in, in the Old Testament from t- different court categories, right? You got, you got history, which is the Pentateuch, and, and then, you know, basically history all the way. And then you got the Psalms, and then you got major prophets and the minor prophets. And so the minor prophets, uh, the bunch, bunch of them with, with, uh, with uh, chapters that are less than X, X number of chapters. So they consider them the minor prophets. So Malachi is one of the minor prophets uh, in the Old Testament. The word Mer- Malachi in the Hebrew literally means my messenger. And that's the reason why many of the more modern theologians will tell you that Malachi uh, is not a name of a person. There was not a prophet called Malachi. But if you believe there was a prophet called Malachi, it's cool too. Good for you. And, uh, but whatever. But it was written because the word Malachi is my messenger. And who would have a name called my messenger? It's like, hi, I'm my messenger cool. It doesn't make sense, right? So it is a general term uh, given to this book for the name of this book called my messenger. Was it a messenger that's writing through this? Absolutely. Was it a prophet that wrote through this? Absolutely. But we're just not too sure what the name is. But if you want to assume it's Malachi, it's good too because most people do. But anyways, it's not, it's not reason to uh, go to war for, okay? So they may not be a person coming like that. Now let me, let me give you a context. So as I say, you know, by the time they, they, the, the book of Malachi was written, the, the building, the temple has already been rebuilt. Now, prior to them return in the time of Esther, in fact, prior to Esther, uh, the prophet Haggai, I don't know, you know, if you can't remember them, don't worry about it. Haggai and Zechariah was basically telling the people of Israel they must repent of their sin. And the reason they're in exile, they lost their the glory temple was destroyed, palace was destroyed, is because they had turned their back on God. And so God had just caused them to be taken away in exile. And so Haggai and Zechariah was proclaiming this message for the people who are actually in exile, saying, you must repent because the days are coming that if you do repent, God is going to cause you to return to your homeland and God is going to cause his temple to be rebuilt. So that was the message. And um, however, in all the interpretation of all the prophecy, somehow they were all led to believe, watch this, that when the temple was rebuilt, 
there goes the messianic age being ushered into the world. I'm going to explain to you what that is, okay? Because a lot of people are still waiting for the messianic age. And, that, um, and so by the time the temple was, uh, by the time Malachi had written this book, the temple has been rebuilt for many years. And there was no messianic age being ushered into the world. And so you can imagine how disappointed most of the Jews were at the time living around the temple, living around Jerusalem and, and in the dif- different uh, towns in, in Judah, Judah. And so people actually have gone cold in, in serving the Lord. Now, I don't know if the prophets intentionally and uh, in sincerely uh, misled the people. I think they were sincere, but I think the problem there that somehow it got interpreted that when the temple was rebuilt, the Messiah would show up and therefore ushering the Messianic age was somehow being interpreted through the emotion of the preachers and the teachers of that time among the Jews. And that is why uh, they all kind of expected, okay, we're going to see some kind of Messianic movement. And uh, so the, their emotion of, you know, the patriotism, the love they have for the country, somehow had taken the pure prophecy of what God would be doing on earth, including the messianic age. And yes, there is a messianic age. Somehow they misinterpreted that because of the emotion. And humans, we have lots of emotion. And therefore, they come to believe that when the temple is rebuilt, the messianic age will be ushered in and that God is going to uh, do vengeance on their enemies and they will be glorious and their nation will be glorious and things will be amazing and fantastic. And it didn't happen and that's why people got disappointed. I want to... um, I want to caution us, you know, so uh, you will read later on that this book addressed to different crowds, and uh, from, from the preachers to the people, you know, the priests, the prophets to the people. So we will go through that together, and, um, but in, it's quite similar in our days if you have paid attention to some of the preaching that is going on, especially in the United States, but not only in the United States, in Canada too, is that many of us preachers, and I say us because I'm one of them, is that we some Somehow allow our emotion to cloud our pre- to 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 cause us to become prejudiced to the message we do indeed hear from the Lord and do indeed read from the Word of God and somehow interpret it through the lens of our prejudice, our emotional prejudice, and come out to become quite different from what the Lord had intended for His church to hear. And it happens all the time throughout ages, you know. And uh, you know, if you if you think about this uh, uh, second coming, some of you probably have noticed there is this uptick in discussion or preaching of the second coming on all the internet channels, TV, whatever, radio station, TV station. There's an uptick of the second coming. And every single time when there's major chaos or major uncertainty like Y2K, you know, or a major chaos, there's this talk about the second coming. And yet 2,000 years later, here we are, still sitting here. He hasn't come back yet. And can you, can, you, can you blame people thinking that this is not going to happen? Because time and again, we use our emotion to interpret the time. And when it doesn't happen, we got egg on our face. And so not only end times, but many other promises that have been given by the Lord and yet misinterpreted by men, even men and women of God, due to our emotion and prejudice. But regardless, the good news is that throughout the whole history of the church, from the day Jesus rose from the dead to now, there's a lot of prejudice and misinterpretation, and yet the grace of God had allowed the message of the gospel to cut through all that. That's why you and I can sit here today and celebrate the goodness of God and hear the gospel and believe in what Jesus is doing and experience his goodness. Can I hear an amen? So in regardless to the imperfect vessel, the message of God will still come through. Now back to the history. So during the time of Zechariah and Haggai, prior to the temple being rebuilt, in fact, prior to the time of Esther, um, while the Jews were still in Persia, they were called to repentance. So the call was from the Lord, but somehow many had come to believe, as I say, that the call is actually means that there is an imminent uh, um, uh, 
new age called the Messianic age coming after the temple was rebuilt. And of course, the temple was, not, uh, was, was rebuilt, but Messianic age was not imminent. Messianic age for the Jews is that the Messiah, the anointed one, will come to Jerusalem and defeat all their enemies and rule the world from Jerusalem. And that Messianic age is still being, being uh, anticipated by the Jews. They're still waiting for the first Messianic age. They, 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 they're still waiting for, for Messiah to show up. And uh, as I mentioned earlier is that, you know, I did, I, when I mentioned the first service, I forgot to mention to you, the Messiah that was prophesied to show up to usher in the Messianic age did not show up until 500 years later. The Messiah didn't show up until 500 years, years or more later. That would be when the birth of Jesus had come. And when he came, he came not in the form that they had expected. He came as a lamb to be persecuted, to be tortured, to suffer under the hands of a foreigner, the Romans. So no wonder they were disillusioned. And no wonder all the disciples keep asking Jesus, so when, when is the kingdom of, God, kingdom of God coming? When is the kingdom of God coming? Because they were told this is how it would happen. And uh, so it didn't happen. And so by the time, um, uh, by the time uh, uh, Malachi, the book of Malachi shows up, people are very disillusioned. And um, in our days, as I said earlier, I want to be, as a preacher, very careful about preaching about you know, different issues like end times and raptures and the apocalypse, but all the other issues. And as I say, throughout history of the church, um, we have done that so many times and we find ourselves in the place of error, right? Now, Jesus will come back and I'm looking for, for him to come back any day now, any time, but I will not predict when because Jesus himself had warned us not to predict when, right? But uh, when he does... The Bible says no one would expect. So I know for sure that it's not anytime soon because a lot of people, millions and tens of million people are expecting him to come. And because they expect him to come, he's not going to come. He says when no one expects, he shows up. And so, so my job as a preacher is to try to preach the truth, hopefully outside the lens of my prejudice and emotion. On all issues, not just end time, uh, not just, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, but all issues. Let me have a confession here. Um, when I was young, a younger preacher, and some of you were with me, and you still stick around, love you so much, thank you so much for your patience. When I was a younger preacher, I was very emotional. And I remember, you know, I took everything personally, because I thought I was called to build his church. But Jesus never called anyone to build his church. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So who is building the church? He is building the church. I just show up to work. And so I thought I was building the church. So when people would leave the church, I would take it personally and get super offended. And so you could hear my anger coming out of my preaching. It is not only unique to me. I know many preachers are like that. I mean, we all talk, you know, we have discussion among us, right? About bemoaning, about people leaving. I did not understand that there will always be movement, people coming in and going out. But I didn't understand that. I took it personally. I felt betrayed, and so anger will come in. So what happened is that I allow my emotion to cloud my ability to hear from God, or at least if I did hear from God, to convey the message clearly. Now, there will be always people coming and going. I didn't understand that. And so I had to confess to you, I had the same problem. And I know many of us preachers have the same problem. So I thank God for the faithful ones that you will be able to, you know, you know, hear the message of God even through all the emotion. And you are big. That's, that was big of you. I thank God for you. But I, I want to tell you this. Even I had the problem, right? So anyways, so back, back to the book of Malachi. All right, and um, so because people were so disappointed with promises that were told that did not come to pass, they resorted back to their own ways. They are cold and had little regards to God. But 
the message of the book of Malachi is not necessarily to reinforce the, messi- the imminent messianic age. The message in the book of Malachi is not just about money or giving. The message was for, um, uh, for the changing of attitudes, was just for different things, but the main thing is the changing of the attitudes that the people had in their heart. And that Malachi was trying to answer uh, or explain to the people at the time why many of them are struggling. You know, they make money and then they feel like money just flow out of their pocket. They're holes in their pockets, as it were. They, and Malachi was trying to explain to them that why they work so hard and get so little. That's what happened to a lot of Christians this day is that they work hard, they work really hard, they, 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 they do above and beyond, and yet they see very marginal success if they were success at all. There's nothing to brag about. I was telling the small, small group leaders yesterday, we had a small group leaders uh, uh, meeting, you know, I say to them that you cannot fake faith. Meaning that your faith must have fruits and that you ought to live a life that is so beyond comprehension to see all kinds of miracles. Then that requires faith. You can talk the talk. It's easy to talk the talk. But people need to see it in your life that what you are sharing, what you're believing is actually working. Can I hear an amen? And it's true for Pastor Paul too, right? So you cannot fake faith. So, so everything has to be real. But you know, it cannot be real unless the messenger live the gospel, live what is promised. So anyways, um, uh, so Malachi was trying to address some of the issues that they were struggling with. And so uh, some of the issues they were struggling with is, was related to the following, is that they had problem, um, or the priests, even the priests, uh, was corrupt. So he was addressing the nation of Israel. He said, you, you got problem because even your priests in our, in our modern day vernacular will be the preachers of your time. They are corrupt. And so God needs to address that. And I'll share with you what, what he meant by being a corrupted priest and preachers, okay? And also Malachi was trying to talk about worship, which has become routine and dry. And I pray to God that our worship here will never become routine and dry. It's not like you need to go through some kind of inspiration to kill time. And that's the reason why we change the service a little bit, you know. We preach first, and then after that we worship, right? So we have a praise, and then we preach, and then a time of worship. You know, it's just, it's just not, an, a, just not a, some kind of routine that we go through so that we can prepare ourselves for the preacher to show up. You know, that's, that's not what, that's not what worship is. And I pray that our worship will be truly entering into the presence of God, touch the heart of God. When you walk out of here, you can say, man, I met Jesus today. And that's the desire of my heart to see that happen. But anyways, and it was, there was also rampant and widespread divorce. And so Malachi was trying to address those issues. There was social justice issue. You know, a lot of people don't believe Christians should be involved in social justice. Malachi will tell you the different story. Malachi it was addressing social justice. And so believers need to care about social justice. It is your problem. If it's a society problem, it is your problem. But anyways, let's move on. And of course, lastly, tithing and the giving. And so that's just one of the very few things that, of many things that he addressed. So tithing and giving is actually a small part. Now, Malachi um, did mention about or prophesied about John the Baptist in chapter 3 and also Jesus in chapter 3. We'll get to that when we, uh, when we go to chapter 3. Now, in our study... Um, for the whole book of Malachi, we're going to focus on spiritual attitudes. Turn to your neighbor and say, spiritual attitudes. People say, Pastor, why do you make people turn to neighbor? Because, you know, just to make sure you're awake, hallelujah, first thing. And the second of all, it's so that we can interact so I don't feel alone up here by myself, hallelujah, that I'm talking to not logs or cabbages or teddy bears, but real people, shaka, right? These days, if you watch those uh, sports uh, shows, those sports, how I many of you watch hockey and basketball? They have those fake individuals sit at the back, right? I, I hate to talk. I mean, you know, I guess psychology, right? Whatever works. But anyways, so uh, we're going to study about um, spiritual attitudes. Yes, God is loving. Make no mistakes about it. It. He's full of grace and mercy, and he loves us, and yet we do not need to impress him. 
There's nothing you can do for him to love you more. He's exhausted his love on you already. And you don't need to curry any more favor from him. He had given you all his favor. Can I hear an amen? amen. But you know, there, should be, there is an issue of us blocking the blessing of God ourselves because of our attitude. Let me give you a very simple example. Is that if you have an attitude or have some kind of prejudice against, uh, say, a, a, a brother, and a brother could have a gift waiting for you, but you want to have nothing to do with your brother, then you'll miss the gift because of the attitude problem. You know, in these days, there's a lot of talk about diversification. I'm glad about that. But you know, you know, sometimes I think we've gone a bit too far. But anyways, the whole idea is that there are talents and abilities that society knew that they missed because of the prejudice in societies. But the society that understand diversity and able to see that there are talents in every race. Can I hear an amen? They give things in every race, every tribe, every language. They can take full advantage or harness all the available talents in the society. And so, you know, but if people have prejudice, they'll miss all the talents. If a boss is prejudiced against a certain type of people, he'll miss recruiting probably the best talents and, 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 and abilities to his company. So you and I want to be careful that our attitude towards God is correct, that we'll see door open, we will not miss what has been given to us. Chapter one, we're gonna talk about chapter one. So our attitude determine, our spiritual attitude determine our altitude, how far we go, right? So we're talking about attitude. Let's go to chapter one. Now, the first thing God had addressed is the preachers. So I'm preaching to myself. You can amen to that too, hallelujah, right? You say, yeah, Pastor Paul, man, that's you. He's talking about you. <laughs> it's okay. I need to be preached to once in a while, you know? So we're going to start with verse 6. A son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am a father, God is talking now to the priest, where is my honor, pastors? And if I'm a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priests who despise my name. But you say, that would be me say, how have we despised your name, God? We never cuss in your name. We don't cuss your name. We won't. What do you mean we despise your name? We're still serving you, preaching and organizing church events and whatnot, you know. What are you talking about? But you say, how have we despised your name? And here it is, by offering. He's not talking about normal people now. He's talking about pastors and priests now. And by offering polluted food upon my altar, when he talks about that, he's saying, you are taking polluted food from people and put it on my altar. Pastor is receiving offerings from people that are not right and receive it and accept it on behalf of God and say to people that you'll be blessed. By saying that the Lord's table may be despised, verse 8, when you offer blind animals in sacrifice, the leftovers, the things that you don't want to use anymore, is that not evil? When you offer those that are lame or sick, is it not evil? Present it to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts? And now entreat the favor of God that he may be gracious to us. With such a gift from your hand, will he show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts? Or that there were one among you who would shut the doors. God is saying that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept an offering from your hand. Watch this. Do you realize that not all offering is accepted of the Lord? You need to find out today what kind of offering is not accepted to the Lord. And if you've been giving those offerings, I encourage you to save your money and have more fried chicken after church. Don't need to give. I give you the permission. Some of you are saying, well, Pastor, you must have, must have millions stacked up. No, we don't have millions stacked up because this is the house of God. He will take care of his house. The day that he doesn't want this house to be taken care of, I'm going to look for another job, right? Can I hear an amen? But anyways, the Lord doesn't accept all the offering. From the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations and every place 
Every, in every place, incense will be offered uh, to my name and a pure offering. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. But you profane it when you say the Lord's table is polluted and its fruit and that is, its food must be despised. But you say, what a weariness this is. And you snort at it. And as, as, as the Lord of hosts, says the Lord of hosts, you bring what has been taken by violence or lame or sick. And this you bring as an offering. Shall I accept that from your hand, says the Lord? Now, let me dwell here a little bit, okay? He's talking to a pastor now, me, people like me. You know, in the old days, we will receive any offering people give. Because we thought we're supposed to build the church. We thought we were supposed to make sure the church is sustainable. We thought it is our responsibility. It's never our responsibility. It's God's responsibility. So we take every dime people would give. And that grieves the heart of the Father because us pastors have allowed people to give with the wrong hearts and the wrong attitude. And that's why in this church you've heard me say this so often. Every time when we receive offering, what do I say? Don't donate. donate. Don't feel sorry for God. Don't donate. That's not the right heart. He doesn't need your donation. I mean, if he needs your donation, he's not worthy to be served. If he needs your money, he's not worthy to be served. He owns a cattle of a thousand hills. Why does he need your money? Give me a break. When you give, you are not donating to, oh, poor God, let me give you some money. Give me a break. Hallelujah. I need to put a smile on your face. I'm not angry, okay? But when you give, it has to be a right heart. You know, when we first moved into this building, some of you were with me, when we first moved into this, Shandai, when we first moved into this building, um, you know, um, the previous pastor and leaders of this building, they have so much garbage in this church, we have to order bins and bins from garbage company to throw all those furnitures away because they were all broken and used furniture and people brought them to church to give it to the Lord. And so I set a policy right there, I told, I told the board and I told everybody that was present, don't bring your garbage to church. It is not appreciated. You know, people like after they bought a new set of furniture, you know, they rent a van and throw them to the church. Brought it to church. Oh, we're just giving it to the Lord. Please, you think he's a beggar? And we preachers gladly took them. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. We're going to use it for uh, those Christmas sales. What do you call those? Uh, not garage sale. Um, bazaar or whatever, right? People sell used clothing or whatever. Some sale, whatever. It's just mental block. But anyways, but you know, so, so I said, no more, one, no, none of those anymore, man. We cannot think like the world. We're not Salvation Army. This is the house of God. We cannot, I as a pastor can no longer take offerings from broken cows with problems, with health problems, limbs. You know, I can no longer as a priest to stand here and receive offerings that is given from the wrong heart. And so don't be offended because now I'm standing before God with this truth, with this message is that you cannot receive offerings and therefore bring it to my altar the things which was not given from a pure heart, from a heart of worship and a heart of praise. So that's why I say if you want to donate, save the money because this house, which is God's house, doesn't need your money. Please give it to somebody who needs the money. Please save it and buy a bigger toy from your children. 
fish for your children or get a bigger McDonald's, Big Mac, if there's such a thing. You know, I haven't been to McDonald's. I don't know what they have these days, you know. Go to Priest Burger, you know, get the Emma Getting, you know, five stacks of patty or whatever. Just enjoy life. God loves you anyways. But don't insult him with a leftover. Can I hear an amen? Come on. A lot of us preachers had made the house of God beggars. And for those of you watching on the internet, we welcome you. Thank you for tuning in. You could go to any other channels, but here you are watching us. I thank you, and, and I hope you're not mad, and, and not preaching to be mad, and, and uh, I'm not mad at all. No, I just, I just, I just, I'm just trying to share the hearts of what Malachi is saying. And so when it comes to offerings, as a pastor, I want to tell you this. You would never hear me raise money in this church. And for those of you who have been here long enough, you can attest that there was not one time I raised money in this church since you came. Now, when I was much younger, I used to do that. You know, when I was younger, I was hanging out with a bunch of these pastors, awesome pastors, so anointed, right? But, you know, bless their heart, they have this idea that you have to preach giving for 10 to 30 minutes before the offering is being taken and so that you can get more offering. What a pressure on me and on you. But these days, we leave the box at the back. People give as they please. But when you give with the right attitude, you will see the blessings of God. And that's the reason why many people give and they got nothing. There is no, there is no open doors. They're not opening any doors. The blessing is right in front of them. And yet they give, they can't get anything. Because it's a wrong heart. They have brought damnation. In other words, they closed the door themselves. God didn't condemn them anymore because we have been redeemed from the curse of the law. Praise God, right? But they can't access it because they shut the door down themselves. The, the blessing is right in front of them. They can't see it. They can't have it. They see other people are being blessed. Oh, Pastor Paul is so blessed. You know, why can't I be like that? Must be a special anointing. Nonsense! It's the right heart. If you can have the faith of the right heart, pray, God, give me the faith. Give me the faith to worship you with my finances. Give me the faith and step up in faith. Don't give leftover. Give your best to God. And I know he's going to honor you. And he's going to honor you. Amen. So, you know, I have a note here. Attitude is often reflected in our giving and gifts. You know, I remember uh, when I was much younger and um, when I was immature, and uh, when Christmas time comes, um, I, did, I think a lot of guys are still like that. We wait to the last minute. We don't put a lot of thoughts into it. And so I'll buy things for my sisters that I know they could care less, but they kept a really positive attitude. Oh, thank you so much. It's amazing. I don't think they ever used any of the gift I buy because it was garbage. It was like, <laughs> no honor. I didn't honor them, right? But you know, when I met my wife, I spent a fortune on everything. That's a different thing, right? So honor change. So I would never buy gifts that I bought my sisters to my wife. Sorry. <laughs> Guys, actually, you know, girls actually are more mature, right? Girls, even at a young age, are always very thoughtful. I look at my daughter. She's always so thoughtful when it comes to gifts. I will not mention another child of mine because that's not necessary. <laughs> <laughs> But girls are always thoughtful. You know, I know girls are more mature in the early age. But my point is this, is that when you give gifts that are with great thoughtfulness, that's the right attitude. It should be the same when it comes to offering. A lot of times we just dump money, donate to church, please save it for something else. Change your heart attitude. I know God is going to bless you in your giving. Amen? All right, let's go to chapter 2, and then we're going to finish for today, okay? 
So I don't know how many more weeks we're going to need for Malachi. <laughs> it took us 11 weeks to finish a four chapters of Colossians, but who knows? Let's see, okay? Chapter 2, verse 6. So first is he's addressing the priests of their attitude as far as offering is concerned, uh, not to receive offerings that are, that are not given in the right hearts and leftover and so forth. The second thing is he's teaching about verse 6. True instruction was in his. The word his is actually about the, the, those true priests, and God was actually in the prior verses is talking about Levi, right? So he's talking about true priests. True instruction was in, 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 in the priest, uh, uh, was in the priest's mouth, and nothing false was found on his lips. In other words, actually, let, let's, let's keep reading, okay? Uh, he walked with me in peace, in rest, in uprightness, and turn many from sin. That's what we do. You see, every Sunday morning, I preach the way I preach. Sometimes I don't go too deep. It's because I know that there may be some in our church that had not given their hearts to the Lord, and I give them the opportunity to hear the gospel, that God is good. I've been accused of being shallow. <laughs> that could be further from the tr- couldn't be further from the truth, right? And, but, you know, I want to preach that so that those who do not know Christ, they can come to know the saving knowledge of Christ. But I also understand that some of you who are here, you're more mature, and so I kind of try to do the balance between the two. But I also do want to encourage you to go to small group. Hello. So we're starting a small group too. So when you go to a small group, you go into a deeper discussion, more in-depth discussion and so forth, right? But anyways, you know, uh, uh, I, I want to preach so that many can be turned away from their sin. And that's what I do is to encourage people, call people to turn away from their sin because there's really nothing in it. But all the goodness is living in the goodness of God, in the mercy of God, in the grace of God. Yes, we have struggle. Yes, we have struggle. We stumble all the time. But God says that he'll forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that's why we do communion to remind ourselves how good God is, right? But so this one of my jobs is to encourage people, hey, you don't need to dwell in sin because it ain't fun there. It provides you some fun, and if you have experienced it, that's fine, but now you want to turn away, you're welcome to turn away. God is waiting for you, and he loves you. But anyways, uh, verse 7, for the lips of the priest are to preserve knowledge, and that's why I teach the way I teach. It's because, you know, I want to preserve the knowledge of God um, in the congregation, in your hearts, in your mind about the truth of God, and that's why I want to preach, uh, you know, teach, not just preach, but teach, right? And um, because he's the messenger of the Lord Almighty, talking about the priest and the people seek instruction from his mouth and uh, I know that there are some of you seek instruction more than just my preaching you know you track my cell phone down you call me because you you want to be accountable and I give you you know whatever instruction I felt the Lord wants you to have and and many of you uh, uh, have told me and praise God you benefit greatly from it but I'm, I'm glad but that's what our job is is to give wisdom and instruction to the people and, but, but for the priest that God was addressing, he said, but you have turned from the way and your teaching have caused many to stumble. You have violated the covenant with Levi, says the Lord Almighty. And this is what happened. So I have caused you who call yourself priests or preachers to be despised, humiliated before people because you have not followed my ways, but have shown partiality or prejudice in the manners of the law or in our context, the word of God. You know, you cannot blame a lot of people these days. They don't respect pastors at all. Like I said earlier, that because we have clouded our preaching with our prejudice, our emotional prejudice, and a lot of things that we say had not come to pass, and we have ache on our face. I remember there was this uh, really renowned so-called prophet that if I'd mentioned her name, you know, many of you would know, and she had prophesied in Singapore about a brother who is a pastor of the largest church in the Philippines that she would, he would be the next president. And he, she was so impressed with him that she, so she prophesied that he, was, he would become the president. Some of you from the Philippines will know who I'm talking about. So he ran the office. He got first time 1% of the vote. Second time, four years later, she prophesied again, and he got 2%. See, a lot of times we lose credibility as pastors and preachers When we allow our emotion to cloud the message that we have, 
to pollute the message that we have. I pray to God that my emotion will always stay out. I mentioned earlier that when I was younger, I had those emotions. But these days, you know, many of us pastors, my good friends, especially those in the U.S., and unfortunately in Canada too, is we got involved in business that we shouldn't be involved in. We preach about politics. We prophesy about politics. Now, if they're American preachers and prophets, that's fine. You know, I understand that. But, you know, I think we have to be so careful because the reason why the people in the days of Malachi had turned cold to the Lord is because they had been promised something that never happened. And they've been promised by people that allow, again, the emotional prejudice to cloud the message of God. 